Thank you for joining us today. The Monrovia team would like to welcome you to the opportunity to explore some garden creativity. For the next hour or so, we'll be inviting you to remove any distractions and just picture yourself in your dream garden. My name is Kathleen Hennessy, and I work with Monrovia's PR agency, Axiom Marketing. I'll be introducing our experts from Monrovia in just a few minutes, but first we have a few details to share with you. We have a large group today, but you will only be seeing the presenters. Your cameras are turned off and your microphones are muted so we can't see or hear you, but we are encouraging everyone to participate by asking questions throughout the presentation. And you can do that by typing your questions into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We have a few Monrovia team members to monitor and answer those questions during the discussion. And we will have some time at the end to answer a few live. And we will follow up with any answers that we don't get to in an after party conversation that we will record and you'll find that on YouTube. We also have a second way for you to participate today. At the beginning of the discussion, we'll be asking for your opinion on a plant combination and that will be coming up in a poll question in just a little bit. So if you miss anything during our talk today, we will be posting this webinar on Monrovia's YouTube channel. You can find lots of great videos and discussions on other topics on that channel as well, so it's definitely worth checking out. With the housekeeping now completed, let's get to know our Monrovia experts. I'd like you to meet Katie Tammany. Katie's, <laughs> Katie's official title is Chief Marketing Officer, but she really fills the role of Chief Storyteller and Trend Spotter here at Monrovia. Katie has more than 20 years of expertise in lifestyle and leisure industries, and she has been tracking consumer trends throughout her career. In 2001, she became the youngest Editor-in-Chief of Sunset Magazine and Sunset Books in the company's history. Katie is a longtime avid gardener with specific interests in the intersections of garden, art, health, and well being. And her favorite place for inspiration is her local garden center. She <laughs> likes to stroll through the different areas, choosing plants and creating potential plant combinations right in the cart, which I think is a great way to get a sneak peek of how things are going to look in the landscape. Hello, Katie. Hello, Kathleen. I'd also like you to meet Georgia Clay. Georgia is the new plants manager at Monrovia, which really means she's our go-to expert for all things plants. In her role, she works with breeders and plant finders from around the world to bring new plants to market for Monrovia. She's a true plant trend finder, trialing and testing plant varieties that we as consumers may not see on the market for many years. Georgia also heads up the sustainability initiatives at Monrovia, with a special emphasis on climate appropriate plants and sustainable packaging and growing methods. Georgia's favorite place to gather garden inspiration is to check out the landscapes through the different neighborhoods while she's riding her bike. What a great way to see what really could work in your own, in your own yard. Hi, Georgia. Hi, Kathleen. So again, thank you to everybody for joining us today with some great information on creating combinations to share with you. So Katie, I'm gonna hand it off to you. Great, thank you. Thanks everyone for joining us and happy almost spring. So let's get into it. What's a perfect plant combo? Well, perfect may be overstating it, but we hope in the next hour to give you a little inspiration and maybe some uh, helpful tips in thinking about planning your own plant combos. So let's start with a little um, poll. What would you choose to plant with this rhododendron? This is called Rosium elegans and it's zones four through eight, but please, if you're in other zones, still vote. Um, this is a wonderful foundation plant or a great sort of show-stopping rhododendron, just beautiful color. Medium size reaches six to eight feet and it's a later spring blooming um, rhododendron. So I'm gonna give you your choices. Um, so would you choose to plant Enchanted Forest River Nymph Pieris um, in front of uh, this beautiful rhododendron? Or maybe you'd go for the Siren Song Dark Night Pucara, or perhaps the luxuriant fringed Bleeding Heart is capturing um, you know, your uh, heart. Uh, so I see the voting going right now. Um, we'll give that a, 
a second or, or two and Kathleen will preside over the, the final vote and tell me. Who Sounds is. good. Let's give it just a few more minutes because it is kind of neck and neck in a few here. So oh. right now it's looking like option B is going to be everybody's favorite so mm -hmm. far, but A and C aren't that far behind and they're pretty, pretty well tied up. So I say let's call it an option B just by a hair. <laughs> well, so option B, um, if you um, move this out of my, move the screen away here. Um, if you chose option B, um, that really speaks to setting an elegant kind of mood in the garden. And it, it, it also uh, reflects a trend that we're seeing a lot of, which is the idea of dark foliage helping to make brighter foliage and brighter flowers really pop out beautifully. Option A, if that was um, your favorite, that um, speaks to kind of a cottage style aesthetic. And um, you might be somebody that, you know, is really attracted to blooms or wants to have um, blooms going on at different times in the garden too. And you think about your plant combos that way because the PRS might give you that, that little bit of um, spring before the rhododendrons get started. And then the luxuriant fringed bleeding heart, if you liked that tone on tone kind of match with that light purple, uh, but you like the change in foliage there, you're somebody that's kind of a, a little bit of an earthier, more bohemian style. You, you think a lot about texture um, and variation in color. So the main point is that anything goes. All of these are good choices. All of these are great plants uh, to pair with the rhododendron. And so, you know, part of the idea behind this poll was to give you an idea that really it's, it is about being creative and following the mood and style um, that you have in mind. There's no, you know, one answer. So today we're going to talk about the art of the combo and how really all gardeners are artists. And we're going to start by talking about uh, palette and maybe some things to keep in mind about the palette that you choose from. And then we're going to talk about space considerations that you might want to keep in mind, whether or not you're talking about a large scale landscape or something a little smaller color trends that uh, we're excited about and want to share with you. And then something that I think of as tonal blends, which is a trend of itself, um, really having to do with calming kind of um, uh, combos in the garden and ways that uh, you can express uh, maybe a more complex artistic idea in your designs. So let's start with how we select from a palette and if our palette is vast or maybe a more narrowed focused palette. About a month ago, we had another webinar about uncovering your garden style and we gave uh, some tips to think about when approaching your overall design of your backyard or your front yard, any outdoor space really. And we, we showed uh, five different style types. And depending on what style you most respond to, that might lend you to think about a palette as well. So if you're somebody that likes a high style, more elegant look, you might be attracted to a narrower palette in terms of choosing your plant combos. You might be drawn more to greens, maybe one color bloom. The outdoor living style gardener is you know, also limited palette, a lot of green, and they definitely want it to be easy care. So that's gonna govern your palette choices as well. But these other styles here, playful, cottage, earthy, there's a much broader mix to choose from. Playful, lots of happy bright colors. Cottage could be pastel or it could be lots of brights. And then earthy is a lot of jewel tones and pastel colors. So um, I think it's worth thinking about that before you go into shopping at the garden center and thinking about if you're a broad mix of color or you wanna keep it narrow. Well, let's start with talking about uh, space considerations. And uh, we're gonna start kind of small and thinking about containers and little pockets of the garden. If you really want a merry riot of color and that's your intention, I say go for it. But if you're looking for a way to um, kind of maybe create a, a different mood or a, a particularly elegant polished look, then my rules of thumb are the following. First, use no more than three bloom colors, including white in your, in your small container or your, um, or your uh, pocket garden. Um, that doesn't mean three plants, that means three bloom colors. 
or maybe choose three tones of one color, bright pink, pale pink, deep pink. That tonal variation can be stunning. Or mix leaf sizes, but keep one color family. Like maybe you just wanna use yellow as your bloom, but then you mix various leaf sizes, you know, broad leaf, strappy, um, to really create some texture. If you keep those in mind, you're gonna really create kind of no fail combos. I have two of my favorites up here. Um, one, just walking around my neighborhood, you know, a uh, beautiful winter blooming Daphne, Aeonium, and a little fuchsia in the background with a, a darker pink. That's a really, you know, beautiful combo here in zone 10 where I live. Um, or you could do something even simpler in a container. Um, this is a favorite of, of mine too, because it's just sort of a happy burst of color. And that's uh, Captain um, uh, Kala, Captain Solo, I think that's called, uh, um, with Ice Dance Japanese Sedge. And that's an easy combo that is totally um, easy care. I mean, it'll last from now through the fall. Um, so those are two ways to go, but Georgia is going to give you um, a few other ways to go, including um, an idea that hits on Another way to think about color, which is a trend that we're seeing a lot of um, in that the, the sort of the idea that we're drawn to happy colors, colors that really communicate joy, um, especially in our containers, on our front porch, um, in your front yard, welcoming people um, to your home. Maybe you want to, you know, really express uh, a happy feeling. And that's a that's a key trend. So, um, Georgia, why don't you tell us about these plants? Yeah, so, you know, we are feeling super cheerful with this combination, but still sticking to your rule, Katie, three flower colors. Um, we've gone with pink, yellow, and blue. The star to me is this yellow echinacea. We're calling it Evolution Ember Sparks. The flowers on this plant are super saturated, super abundant, and best of all, they're held on these really nice sturdy stems, so they're not going to flop over on you in the garden, in your little pocket garden, or in your container, so really low maintenance. Um, they're also wonderful pollinator plants. Um, I really love the look of the yellow petals, and then you can see that detail paired with that bright green cone. Um, and I also love how it really bridges uh, the blue flowers from the creeping phlox with that bright pink flower of the super cow pink petunia. This is a hardier plant combination. So you can see zones four, zones three, and in colder zones, annuals like petunias can be a really great tool to add those pops of color. Uh, these super cows are sort of a class of their own. They are amazing plants. They're hybrids between calibrachoa and petunia. And what that does, that mix gives us an exceptional garden performance. So they're going to stand up really well to the heat, to the rain, to the wind, um, even to those late season frosts that can sometimes come rather unexpectedly. Um, they also have those really large, super showy flowers that are going to self-clean. And my favorite trait is that they don't have that stickiness that you can get on the foliage of regular petunias. So this is a, a just a beautiful combo that you can actually apply to you know many other plants. So I think one of the things that I appreciate, Georgia, is you've come up with. Well, here's a whole other look if you're in you know warmer zones. Yeah. So with a simple plant swap, you can really get that same feel, but with a totally different climate. So it's less about you know the individual plant we're talking about and more about the rules and the feels that we're going for. So here is something that would be great for the south. We're getting that pop of pink with the gorgeous summer lasting strawberry crepe myrtle. This crepe myrtle was bred for early flowers and lots and lots of them. So it just puts on the flowers throughout a really long season, uh, several intense flushes of pink throughout that season. Also has excellent disease resistance. So issues like Circospora and powdery mildew, it really handles those well and it doesn't have issues. Um, I really love the habit as well. It's super unique shrub-like habit. So at max, it's going to be about three feet tall by three feet wide. So really easy to maintain. It makes a super interesting flowering shrub, easy to tuck into those smaller border areas. We also grow them in patio tree form, which would make a really lovely container specimen as well. And then here we're pairing it with a yellow jessamine vine. 
This is another great pollinator plant. Double shot is a really cool, uh, is a really cool one because we planted both the Carolina jessamine and the swamp jessamine in one container to extend your blooming season. So those two plants have almost identical flowers. So throughout the spring, you have the Carolina jessamine in bloom. And then as the summer heats up and that Carolina starts to peter out, the swamp jessamine takes over and it gives you blooms from summer into fall. Um, really awesome flower power that way. And then bringing it all together is that ground cover verbena, Endurascape dark purple, where most verbenas will cycle out a flower when it gets really hot. The Endurascapes have exceptional heat tolerance and will continue to flower throughout the heat of the summer. I think one of the things I like about this combo is that it has a lot of energy to it. And sometimes we want to create that moment in our garden with a lot of energy, whether that's, you know, this would make a great border, you know, in a front yard or, or a container. Um, but maybe we want to go for something still happy, but a little um, calmer, a little bit, you know, more softer energy. <laughs> and in that case, I think this combo um, that we think of as like sunny day, provides a lot of interest, but in a different way. You wanna take us through what the, the key points are with this one? Yeah, so this is, you know, using that shade, that the shade of the same color that you had mentioned in the beginning slide, Katie, um, but, but mixing it up with texture and variation in bloom sizes. So Sun Believable Brown Eyed Girl is an annual sunflower that's able to give you blooms from late spring all the way to your first frost, uh, providing up to a thousand blooms per plant with, uh, without the need to deadhead, which is always a plus for low maintenance. Um, this is a mounding type sunflower as well. So it's ultimately gonna fill about a three foot tall by three foot wide space. So definitely not your traditional vertical one and done sunflower. This is going to put on a massive show for a super long season. I also love that on this brown eyed girl, that brown eye in the center gets darker and more intense as you get closer to the fall. So it really transitions perfectly from your summer containers into your fall decor. And then we're pairing it with the sunburst spreading lantana, which has beautiful heat and drought tolerance, and also those gorgeous smaller yellow flowers. And then bringing it all together with a strappy golden grass, something like bull's golden sedge would play well here uh, for that texture and adding a little bit of movement as well. Yeah, and you could also take in that brown eye, you know, as a, a key component, the brown eye and the brown eyed girl, you could add instead of the lantana, you could add some darker foliage, you know, plant if you really wanted to make this unbelievable pop, especially. So it's kind of thinking about um, you're creating a little symphony uh, here and you can, you know, either have, you know, one plant kind of be the star and really um, be more pronounced or you could keep everything kind of, you know, on the same um, level. So I wanted to talk about uh, larger areas and how should you think about those? Um, longer borders, you know, maybe a backdrop to your yard. How, how do you think about color combinations differently? Well, one thing is really thinking about repetition and the rhythm you create when you use multiples. Um, if you look at this pretty expansive backyard here, you'll notice that it's actually got a pretty tight palette. You know, it uses yellow and white to brighten things up, maybe a little bit of chartreuse lime. And then you've got that, you know, darker burgundy um, foliage uh, in the, the grasses that were chosen and in other shrubs. And by repeating those colors throughout the border, you get a unified look. Um, and remember too that foliage is also a color. Um, as you're putting things together on the cart, at the garden center, or stepping back and thinking about the mood you wanna create, it's not just about um, blooms. And in fact, the more you can think about how you want your garden to look you know, through the seasons, the more you're gonna be drawn to foliage as being a key part of how you think about plant combos. I think the other key thing in thinking about larger areas and your plant combinations is that height matters, right? You don't want to plant, you know, everything that's gonna become the same height. You wanna think in terms of layers. What's gonna be your, you know, tall um, backdrop um, or what's gonna, you know, get tall and make sure that you place that in the back of, of that border or along that foundation. Um, and this, uh, 
this uh, look, this landscape um, is also making me think about that dark versus light um, trend, Georgia, that we've been following uh, quite closely. And I know um, that's one way that you can um, kind of create something really artful, um, but very simple in a longer um, border. You wanna talk through this combo? Yeah, so this is um, that dark meets light sort of dramatic combination. It starts with the Little Joker nine bark, which has that beautiful dark purple foliage, but then puts on a really heavy display of flowers. You have this really nice um, blush pink white flower, super heavy, really nice contrast between that dark foliage and that white flower. It's going to be a nice rounded four feet tall shrub. So nice towards the back of your border, especially in mass along those longer, uh, along those longer beds. Um, you can pair that with other dark foliage varieties to play up that drama a bit. Um, we have the Siren Song Dark Knight Hookra here, which is a more sun tolerant hookra. Um, it holds that deep color super well throughout the season. I also like that the blooms are on more compact scapes. So although the hookra blooms are quite dainty, you're really able to enjoy them for longer. They're not gonna flop over. Um, I really do appreciate that characteristic of these plants. And then using something like hens and chicks, this one is Krebs Desert. Um, as a ground cover gives you this really refined, structured, interesting texture. Again, playing with those deep, dark colors, but I love that the foliage on this fluctuates between greens and purple and burgundy, which gives you this really nice variation throughout the season. And we know from our opening poll that I think a lot of people are um, seeing the possibilities with the Dark Knight Hookra. It really goes with everything. Uh, but there are some other choices too, if you want to express this look in a, um, especially in, in warmer zones. Right, yeah, so um, this combination gives you that same dark meets light feel as the last combination, but it's geared more towards a hotter, drier climate, just to give you some ideas of what else you can do with it with things that are available in your region. Um, so Mangave Mission to Mars, this is another awesome hybrid between Manfreda and Agave. That cross gives you this really tough succulent that can not only handle drought like you'd expect from an agave, but it can also handle slightly more water than a traditional agave can. So if you struggle with dry and wet cycles, this can be a little bit better option for you. Um, it also creates these really cool textures and forms that you wouldn't traditionally see in an agave also. Um, I really love Mission to Mars because it does have that deep maroon purple color and it looks beautiful paired against a silvery blue. I chose blue chalk sticks here for that ground cover silver blue look. Um, I love the contrast in color and in texture, you know, with that larger foliage paired with the smaller succulent foliage. Um, and then we've added purple fountain grass in for some height and movement. This particular variety is seedless, so you don't have to worry about it reseeding and becoming invasive. Just stunning, I think, really, really elegant. Um, let's go on to thinking about how you design around your entertaining and outdoor room spaces. Um, we get a lot of questions about, you know, do, how do I think about my furniture with my plant combinations? And I think overall, we want to keep the mood relaxed around these spaces. Um, and that means that if we do choose some showy blooms or color that we might want to soften it with grasses and evergreens. And one rule of thumb I like to keep in mind, um, I'm noticing designers, you know, tend to do really well, is that, you know, they, they kind of, that they use either a very warm green, you know, even if you have a lot of um, variations in what plants you're using, or cool greens and grays. And so I think that that's the other guideline um, to keep in mind. And George is going to walk us through a few great combo ideas for outdoor rooms. Yeah, so um, we are labeling this combo, you can see refreshing and refined, and I think refined is a great word to describe this hydrangea in the combo, uh, Seaside Serenade Cape Lookout Hydrangea. It is a stunning refined focal point here, 
super uh, naturally compact habit. It's only going to be about three to four feet tall and wide, super thick, sturdy stem. So it's not going to flop over on you, creating that really low maintenance plant, but still giving you the blooms that you really are looking for. Um, so that's not going to flop even in full flower or during those summer storms. It's just really nice and tidy. Um, this is partly due to its, uh, its breeding. This is a tetraploid plant a super cool all natural breeding feature um, that helps the flowers and the foliage also be really nice and thick and leathery. Um, because that foliage is thick and tough, it's able to stay clean. It's less susceptible to tattering in those strong winds and to wilting on those hot summer days where so many hydrangeas can sort of wilt and look kind of sad in the garden. These ones stand up to it a lot better. Um, it also means that the flowers, because they're really thick and leathery still, they're going to last up to three months on the plant. Um, and they also make a fantastic long lasting cut flower as well. Um, this is a fantastic variety. It puts on a ton of blooms and it'll bloom on both old and new wood. Cape Lookout is one of my favorites because I love a classic white flower, but I also love it gets this nice subtle touch of blush in it as well. Um, pair this with evergreen structure like green tower boxwood and a strappy variegated grass like this Evercolor Everest sedge and you have this really classic sophisticated combination. Yeah, I love the way that the variegated sedge is really kind of the bridge between the hydrangea and the boxwood. And again, you still have a lot of foliage variety here, so it makes for a, a very interesting combo. You could also apply the same palette to <laughs> yeah, so if you're in a warmer zone, say you're a little bit too hot, a little bit too sunny to have a hydrangea in your space, um, you can get that same feel with, again, a simple swap, nitty gritty white rose, great for the heat, great for the sun, and it has that beautiful bright white flower. The flower is going to self clean and repeat bloom throughout the summer, so really low maintenance. It has this beautiful glossy foliage that's highly resistant to diseases like black spot. So you're not gonna have to spray it. You're not gonna worry about a really high maintenance rose. Um, we've tested that disease resistance extensively throughout the country, um, even at our South Georgia nursery where that disease pressure is extremely high. These have done beautifully. Um, this nitty gritty series is on their own route and they're a little bit wider than tall. So about three feet tall by four feet wide. Um, we're also growing them in patio tree form as well. So again, great in container, something a little bit unexpected. Um, we're pairing it with that same evergreen structure. And then instead of the carrots, we've opted for an agapanthus sunstripe. Um, agapanthus is a sun and heat lover, but it still gives us that same strappy variegated feel. And this would even look really great as a as a plant combo, even in separate pots. You could do you could do these three separate containers, which would look really striking and elegant. But let's say that's a little too kind of that refined and refreshing is maybe a little too muted for you, um, or maybe you want to create a combo with more of a feeling of escape. You know, really being on vacation, not quite so restrained, playing with color. I think one of the things I really like around pools and patios is to, to really use a warm, bright uh, palette. You know, it's great contrast with pools in particular. Um, and think about your foliage in terms of exotic patterning, sizes of foliage. Uh, I think the color here can be wilder, a lot of orange and yellow, or you can keep it more refined. And George is gonna talk about both approaches. So first let's start with the wilder side of color um, with this paradise found combo that you've created. Yeah, so this is a great example, Katie, you mentioned uh, utilizing color in both flower and in foliage, and we've done that here. So we're starting with shrubs like Jazzy Jewel Amber Tropical Hibiscus. This is a fantastic shrub. It produces a ton of really large flowers that bloom consistently from top to bottom and they hold on to those blooms for up to three days. Um, that's awesome because traditionally tropical hibiscus are only gonna hold their flowers for one day. So that extra two days combined with just the amount of flowers produced 
really gives you an incredible flower display uh, where you're really wanting it most in this lush tropical uh, feel combination. Um, the foliage also provides a really nice backdrop because it's really deep, dark, glossy green, and it has great resistance to bacterial leaf spot, which can sometimes plague these tropical hibiscus. We're echoing that orange color of the flower with the foliage and flower of Tropicana canna lily. The orange really pops and it's a gorgeous plant on its own, but it's beautiful when paired with something lush and green like this foxtail fern. And then we've rounded out the look with the texture and color from this bright star yucca to give you a little pop of bright, sunny, cheerful yellow. I really love this combo in particular in containers because uh, many of these plants, the tropical hibiscus, foxtail fern, canna, they can be brought inside or stored in a garage to overwinter if you're in a colder area. But as I said, you can also have this kind of a paradise tropics look with a little bit of a more refined palette, you know, more narrowed down a bit. Tell us about what you put together here. Yeah, so a uh, more refined palette, but it still feels very tropical and very fresh. Again, we're using Jazzy Jewel Tropical Hibiscus, but this is a different flavor. It's called Opal, a gorgeous white flower with that deep red eye that again, it blooms from top to bottom, has those long lasting flowers, deep, dark, glossy foliage, a great plant. And then we're pairing it with Superstar Cordyline. I love this cordyline. I think it's my favorite one on the market. I think it's one of those, you just have to see it in person. It's so unique. Um, it has these really extra wide, dark purple burgundy foliage that is extremely high gloss. Um, then we're echoing that color with Burgundy Queen Bougainvillea. Uh, this is a vine with gorgeous burgundy red new foliage on top of those beautiful burgundy bracts that just bloom super prolifically uh, for an awesome vertical statement. You could easily switch that Bougainvillea with Mandevilla if you wanted something, um, you know, feel free to play with it. There's all sorts of ways to impact that color into your landscape. I liked, uh, I like what you say about the cordyline. I feel the same way about this plant and I love how versatile it is. It looks fantastic with lime green. Um, that's a great pairing. Uh, looks really wonderful with pink, with white. It's kind of a foolproof uh, combo <laughs> addition. Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about what I mean by tonal blends. Um, and I, I call this way of thinking kind of a, a good way to create an easy transition, either between garden spaces or welcoming people to your front yard. The idea is that we're kind of all needing, you know, to, um, to create feelings of calm, I think, these days. And by using a melange of softer tones and kind of blurred lines, um, having plants kind of, you know, kiss, if you will, if not tackle each other, um, that can help create this feeling of calm. Um, you can also see it when you choose one bloom color softened by a variety of different kinds of foliage. And then I think one of the um, particularly new trends here is what we call metallics, using um, metallics or grays to create a sense of luster and spark in a combo. So we're going to go through a few of these combos that really represent this trend next. And we'll start with the gemstone combo. Um, this would look great, I think, um, as a, you know, front yard, um, curb appeal, uh, kind of unexpected uh, pairing with uh, the foliage um, changes here. I think that that's what's really enticing about this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we're playing with those purple tones. So you had mentioned using the same flower color with different textures and different foliage. And um, I think this does it beautifully. We're utilizing the Seaside Serenade Hydrangea. This one is called Newport. Uh, this plant has the same breeding we talked about in that earlier combination with the white flowering hydrangea. Uh, you know, sturdy habit, long lasting flowers, tough foliage. But this has a purple flower color that I just love. It's a really unique and hard to find color in the marketplace. And I think it's just another feature that makes Newport really stand out from the crowd on top of all of its low maintenance uh, breeding that is inside that plant. Um, We're utilizing that same flower color in the purple dragon dead nettle or lamium. 
Um, Katie, you talked about adding metallics for a little something special. Mm -hmm. And this foliage does that with that silvery uh, variegation in there. Um, I also find that the hummingbirds are attracted to lamium in my garden. Mm -hmm. So that's just another reason why it's my one of my personal favorite ground covers to use in the shade. Um, and then pairing these two with Gotemba uh, makes everything just really pop and it makes the purple shine even brighter. I think um, what a welcome in your front yard to see this combination. Um, also wonderful, the Gotemba in late summer because you do get white flowers and then they mature to this really uh, deep purple blackberry, really nice size as well. So five to eight feet tall and wide in the garden. Yeah, just, just sparkles. This is a, a great one. And then this is a very different kind of mood. Um, I think of it as a definitely quieter, um, but really uh, surprising kind of combo. And, and the idea is to bring the variation that you might see in a sunset actually into your, your yard. So go ahead and talk about this one. Yeah, so these ombre shades of orangey red tones are wonderful in the garden. I really love this angel nine bark here um, because it emerges bright orange when that foliage first emerges and then it matures to these shades of burgundy and red. So it just has a lot of dynamic colors in the foliage. Um, the size is about five feet tall. So again, great for the back of the border, great in mass if you'd like that. Um, we're pairing this with Orangina. This is such a cool shrub that was brought to us by Dan Hinckley, um, a plant explorer that we work really closely with. Um, he brings us a lot of really cool stuff and this is one of them. This is an evergreen with that fresh, beautiful orange new growth. The foliage on this plant is always colorful, uh, moving from oranges to reds to yellows, uh, turning that bright crimson red in the cooler months. So all those sunset colors that you had mentioned, Katie. Um, I can easily see this orangina making a fantastic boxwood replacement. It has that naturally mounded habit and it shears really nicely. So it could fill that similar role. Um, I will point out that it says vaccinium, and I know some of you will think blueberry, edible, um, edible garden, um, but this is a totally different species. So it does create a tiny berry that's non-edible, um, but you really don't grow it for that. You grow it for the foliage and for the evergreen structure. Um, and then adding in supreme cantaloupe, that would look great in here as well with this color palette, that unique melon orange double flower uh, that's going to bloom throughout the summer. And this is another palette that you can just apply with lots of different plants. You'd be surprised at how many plants there are with this kind of foliage and, you know, bloom. So here's another swap that you could do. Right, yeah, so you can achieve, achieve the same feel just by swapping the orangina with something more cold hardy if you're not zone seven and above. So spirea is super low maintenance. They're hardy all the way down to zone four. Um, and butterscotch baby imparts those same beautiful caramel sunset tones throughout this that, that orangina did. So beautiful color in both the spring and the fall. You get summer flowers. Butterscotch Baby is really unique. It's super compact. So it's only gonna be about a foot and a half tall at max. Also has a really nice mounded mushroom cap shape that makes it a really nice candidate for mass planting near the front of a border and using in ways that you wouldn't traditionally be able to use a spirea. And then again, that Supreme Cantaloupe and the Angel Nine Bark pairing with it beautifully. Yeah, I like the form variation you would get too, not just the colors uniting um, all these plants, but the different forms that they take, I think would look stunning together. So let's turn to a very popular color. Uh, Pantone's color of the year is very peri, meant to express, you know, kind of a carefree feeling and joy and warmth. Um, but here we've um, paired it with two um, plants that I think keep it sort of in the soothing family that I was talking about before and keep, keep this idea of, you know, calm carefree uh, beauty. So tell us, um, tell us what you selected here. Yeah, so the blue flowers of Blue Balloon Bluebeard are a perfect fit for this very peri inspired planting. Uh, Bluebeard or Caryopteris, easier for me to say Caryopteris, um, is a wonderful late summer bloomer. 
um, and it provides a abundance of food for pollinators. Um, bees love the flower and it provides that food towards the end of the summer when pollinators need it the most and there are less options in the garden. It's also hard to find that sort of very peri blue color in the garden. So this is a great shrub for that. Um, that's gonna be about two to three feet tall and wide. So really easy, really versatile to pair with whatever um, else you've got going on in the garden. Um, but pairing that blue with nitty gritty peach softens it a bit and adds something a little bit unexpected. You said soothing. I think that's a great word. Um, <clears throat> nitty gritty, like we've talked about, sprawling type rows, great for planting in mass, repeat blooms throughout the summer and has that healthy, glossy foliage. Um, nitty gritty peach also has a really subtle, uh, really nice fragrance. So that's an added bonus of this particular variety. Um, and then, of course, we're adding more silvery blue tones and texture with something like the Elijah blue fescue that really completes the look. Yeah, it gives that that little bit of metallic I was talking about. And here's another way to go. Same idea. Yeah, so this is the same idea, um, but more for a warm coastal garden. So you can see just really easy to swap in and out. Go to your local garden center and see what fits in your area. Um, but here we have Champion Hebe, which covers itself in those violet purple blue flowers. And it has this gorgeous cupped, nice glossy dark green foliage. And I just love that in the winter it gets this beautiful purple cast that really sort of pairs well with that very peri both in color of, uh, of flower and in foliage. We're keeping the nitty gritty peach, but changing that blue fescue for, um, for something a little more coastal friendly like the Casa Blue Dianella to give that silvery blue texture. And then I think this is probably my favorite combination of the, uh, you know, the whole, everything that we've shared. Um, Cause I feel like this is pretty special and different and it has that metallic kind of quality with the silvery gray. Um, but it just looks really, really rich and lustrous. And um, I'm, I'm just, I'm wild about this one. Yeah, the metallics on this one is really uh, super unique. I think it would make just a, a fantastic statement in the garden, especially a shade garden where you don't often get those metallics and silvers. Mm -hmm. um, but it starts in late winter when that cascade blush hellebore appears stunning, large, deep purple flowers. I really love this because it does have that evergreen foliage, so it doesn't just go away. You've got that still in there. Um, then we have Plum Passion Improved Hydrangea. This is an Aspera type, so it's going to be about five to six feet tall and wide. The new foliage, when it emerges, it's these gorgeous shades of greens and purples, and then it matures to a deeper purple, almost silvery color with a deep purple underside for the rest of the season. So really fantastic foliage. It also is sort of um, almost, I don't want to say fuzzy, but it sort of has a texture to it. Mm -hmm. um, I love the lace cap flowers as well. They're sort of bicolor white with a subtle blush light purple tinge. Um, we're carrying that silvery purple look with the stunning regal red painted fern um, and then adding tectonic magma begonia, which is a awesome new begonia, again, brought to us by Dan Hinckley. It has that subtle sort of gunmetal blue hue with the reddish purple underside. These are plants that we've surprisingly overwintered for years in Oregon, where I'm at, which is a zone eight, borderline zone seven, I'd say. Um, and they've also been overwintered in the ground further north with good success as well. So further trials for hardiness, but we're pretty pleased with zone eight. We weren't expecting it. Um, great for adding texture to the shade garden. Um, I also really love to use these tectonic begonias um, in containers because they are awesome for um, keeping outdoor in summer months and then moving them inside as a temporary house plant during those colder winter months if you are in the colder zones. And I would say, I think of that Plum Passion uh, hydrangea similarly to what we mentioned with the cordyline in that it goes with everything. You know, it, it has surprising variation in the blooms um, that make it a great match for many styles of garden, for other um, different colored blooms. Um, so definitely one to seek out. Um, but you could also swap out those choices. <laughs> Yeah, so again, a few simple swaps make this a lot hardier. So we've gotten rid of the Aspera type hydrangea for this macrophylla type, Seaside Serenade Glacier Bay. 
Um, this is one of our brand new varieties. We're having a soft release of it this spring, um, which means availability will be limited, but it is really super special. And I can't wait for it to get out um, because it has these really large pure white lace cap flowers and then a contrasting jet black stem. It's super modern feeling. Um, and then just like you would expect from the Seaside Serenade series, they have great rebloom. Mm -hmm. The stems on these are slightly more upright, but that just allows you to really see and enjoy the black stems um, as you should be. But the overall habit is still very bushy and sturdy. And then we've added the purple tones back in by utilizing the Grande Amethyst Hucra instead of the Begonia. Um, this gets the name Grande because it has extra large foliage. It forms a super big, bold, colorful mound. Um, I love this plant in this combo because it does have that purple foliage, but it has this beautiful silvery cast over it, which plays nicely with that metallic uh, palette we're playing with here with the rest of the plants. And then finally, if you want to kind of, I guess, take it up a little bit brighter, um, here's a way to go with that uh, tonal quality I was talking about that's still um, unexpected uh, because of the colors we've chosen um, and not you know it's not the um, riot of color because because we've kept it kind of unified but it looks really different from anything else you know you might be thinking of for spring. Mm -hmm. Yeah so Chateau the Rose of Sharon is such a gorgeous shrub and our Chateau series is absolutely fantastic. They just produce so many flowers, buds, and blooms up and down the stem at just about every single internode. And what that does, having a bud at every internode, it just greatly increases not only the bloom quantity, but the bloom time. You're just having a lot more buds opening up, so you're extending your season for a lot longer. Um, Chantilly is the variety that's pictured here, and it has those gorgeous large white blooms with that deep pink eye that we're then carrying through to all the rest of the plants. Um, so it also makes a great backdrop to this Coco Chill Wygelia. Uh, Wygelia is a low maintenance shrub. It's gonna provide a lot of color with that deep purple foliage, but then that bright pink magenta flower. And then we're adding the stunning color burst rose cape fuchsia for even more of that flower power in that same magenta pink tone. Um, cape fuchsias are great. They're super easy care and they have tubular flowers that are really attractive to hummingbirds. So that's always a plus in my book. Um, this variety stays smaller than the typical species. So it's gonna stay right around three feet tall or so in the garden, so pretty well behaved. But again, you could easily swap this out for um, other pink or magenta flowering perennials if you need something more hardy or less hardy, whatever you need, you could swap it out with a, that same feel, that same flower color. Mm -hmm. And this is, um, this is a color palette to, you know, when you go to the garden center to look out for plants that, you know, would have the, these qualities, these properties and, and put them together on a cart to see, um, you know, kind of the variations that you could get even with this, this palette. So those are the um, sort of the top combo ideas that we have to share today. And we actually will, we're producing a Shades of Beautiful uh, guide that um, has all of these combinations in it, as well as others that will be available in a couple of weeks. Um, if you sign up for our email um, newsletter, you can receive that. Um, but I think we have a little, little time, Kathleen, to, to entertain some questions. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> I didn't want everybody to hear me typing away as I was trying to answer a few questions and gather a few for you guys to answer live. Um, we do have some great questions. Um, and I just wanted to put a reminder out there for everybody that this webinar will be on Monrovia's YouTube channel. So you can refer back to it and get to the point where you want to get your questions answered. So lots of questions on how they could um, access the webinar and that it will be on the YouTube channel soon. So I've got a bunch of questions and I'm just gonna fire them at you. I don't think any of them are stumpers, but some really great and insightful questions today. So let's start with, what was the name of the rhododendron that you used in the poll? 
Oh, it's Rosium Elegans, and you can find it on Monrovia.com. Perfect. So a good question here on design. So you talked a lot about the idea of three colors in a design, and someone wanted to know, is green considered a neutral, or would that count as a color? When I said three colors, I was thinking about blooms, especially. So the green could kind of be your neutral connecting, you know, of, you know, bringing the blooms together. Perfect. Great. So next question is about the verbena that you talked about, Georgia. Um, a question about do you deadhead it or does it need to be just cut way back? Um, you can do really either. Verbena do a pretty good job of reflushing. Um, I'm self-admitted lazy gardener. I don't deadhead my verbena. Um, and the endoscapes do just fine for me, but um, whatever you typically do would probably be best for your verbena. Great. Good information there. So question on Seaside Serenade Cape Lookout. And really kind of a question overall, um, people are always confused about what partial sun means. The specific question is, can Cape Lookout take morning sun? Um, yeah, I have one in my garden that takes morning sun and it does just fine. It's shaded the rest of the day. Um, I forget the exact number of hours part sun they say is the rule, but, um, you know, we can my, I, have, I have Cape Lookout and I moved it. I originally planted it around my um, fire pit and it didn't like that much sun. And I moved it maybe five feet away to where the awning was. Um, and just that little change, barely less sun, um, it looks beautiful in that spot now. So it sort of depends on how intense your sun is as well. Um, I'm in Oregon, so not quite as intense as other places. Sounds good. Maybe we can follow up on kind of that partial sun um, on our next Q&A after party. Sure. Sounds good. Can brown eyed girl over winter in zone 10A? This is an annual. Uh, I would say you can try it, but um, we typically like to think of it as an annual. Great. So we hear a lot about rules for containers, um, especially when you're designing a container about using a high, medium, and low grower. Are there rules for landscape borders? Hmm. Uh, well, I, I, what I mentioned before is, is really making sure, you know, you're going to put your taller plants in the back. That seems kind of obvious, but sometimes um, we choose things that are gonna, you know, we might have two plants together that sort of compete um, and then you're gonna hide something really beautiful in the back. So I would say, you know, it's good to think in terms of layers, not necessarily three layers, but just making sure that um, that you've got some height variation. Uh, it's not the same as the thriller, filler, spiller idea of the, of the container. And there's certainly lots of containers that you don't need to use the thriller, filler, spiller. You can have everything at one height and that looks beautiful. That looks really dramatic. But when it comes to a border, you do wanna layer things a bit more. Excellent advice. Um, Katie, another one for you, this might be putting you on the spot, but somebody was asking about a gardenia for zone 10. So I was wondering if you had a favorite. I do. Um, it's, and I'm, I'm going to have to, you know, plead, I'm going to have to look up the name exactly, but it's actually a gardenia with smaller blooms in Georgia. I don't know if you know which one I'm talking about, <laughs> but, um, but it's got, uh, it's got smaller, um, uh, not daisy-like flowers, but it's just a, it's a surprising gardenia. It doesn't have the big full flowers. It's really, really lovely and it stays pretty compact. Okay, now I'm, I'm throwing this back <laughs> or, or the Monrovia people behind the scenes who might be able to answer this with a quick look up. Um, Is it August Beauty maybe? Maybe, I have it actually in my garden. Um, I'd run out and go take a picture, but, uh, <laughs> but How about if we follow up and we can actually even add the picture when we do the yeah, follow up yeah. Q and A. I think that sounds like a great plan. That sounds good. So Georgia, this one might be a stumper actually. Um, people were wondering if Orangina is deer resistant and I know it's, it's very new. So tell us what you know about that. Well, um, that's tricky. It's, I don't personally know. Um, I do know that deer are really highly regional. And so, you know, it might be that you plant Orangina 
like any other evergreen shrub that you have and one year they don't touch it and the next year they they discover a taste for it so you know i it's tough to say what deer will and won't eat <laughs> um, so you know typically deer don't like plants that have a lot of texture so like fuzzy or spiky or sappy something that kind of makes it less uh, interested and orangina does not have any of those characteristics so it would be interesting to see um, what happened in your garden. Excellent. We had a couple more questions come in, one of which um, was about uh, from a fellow hydrangea fanatic, which I um, confessed to be, um, asking about if there are if there are rules for having it not look chaotic if you just have a bunch of hydrangeas in an area. Hmm. And I always say you can't have too many. <laughs> I, I kind of agree with that. And I think hydrangeas planted in mass are lovely, really lovely. Um, we actually have a, a story on our website right now about how to plant in mass and why you should. And hydrangeas make a fantastic um, ribbon of color. Um, I, I, I'd say go for it. No danger there. We had somebody type in and say, was the name of the gardenia buttons? No, I'm going to I'm going to do a quick look up. On the a, lot other. People, a lot of people said radican too. I'm not sure mm -hmm. if I'm pronouncing that correct, but we will get that answer in our in our follow up Q Q and A for sure. That is good. Um, lots of questions about zone picking the right plant for the zone. How can people get information on monrovia.com about plants that are right for them? So we recommend going to um, My Plant Finder. Um, you can click on it right at the top of our website um, and make sure that you've got your zone um, you know, entered or your, your uh, zip code. And once you do that, you can look up plants you know, by the problem you're trying to solve by bloom time, by color. Um, and it's a great way to narrow down, you know, our entire list to something that you know is going to fit your zone. Um, and I did figure out the name of the gardenia. It's First Love Gardenia. Perfect. I still think we're going to put the, the picture of your personal yes. one. I think that'll be great. Well, that's really all the time that we have for today. Thank you again to everybody for joining us. And I know we didn't get to everybody's questions, so we will do a follow-up Q&A and answer them all in a separate conversation. And you'll receive an email with information on how to access that conversation. So thank you, Katie. Thank you, Georgia. It's great to be here again and happy spring, everyone. We look forward to sharing more with you in the coming months. Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. It's been fun. It's been great. Thanks, guys. Bye. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye, all. <laughs>